Welcome to RICO 12. I'm Justin, your host, and a beautifully imperfect, stumbling, bumbling child of an absolutely powerful and perfectly loving God and an addict. RICO 12 is all about exploring the common threads of addiction and sharing tools and hope from those on a similar path. We gather from diverse backgrounds, faiths, and places to learn and support one another. Our speakers represent various fellowships, addictions, and afflictions, thus showing the common threads of recovery, no matter what we are dealing with in our lives. Today's speaker for the 259th meeting is Michael S., who has previously spoken on RICO 12 three times on meetings number 68, 110, and meeting number 200. His chosen topic today is life after 11 years of recovery, and I look forward to hearing his message here in a few minutes, but first for a little bit of business. Rico 12 has several recovery resources in our family of podcasts and social media communities. To learn more, listen more, connect more, or just hang out and learn and grow with us, you can check out the other podcasts that you can find at Rico12.com. That's R-E-C-O-1-2.com, like Recovery 12 Step, Rico 12. To join our social communities, you can check out the chat and the show notes that we, that I'll have those links in there to do that. RICO 12 is self-supporting and your contributions help us continue our mission. Thank uh, Thanks to our spearheads for new and repeat contributors. This week, this week, I wish to acknowledge and thank both Kristen and Angela who became new spearhead donors this last week. Your donations really help in this project. If you also feel the desire to become a spearhead and support this cause, go ahead and visit us at rico12.com forward slash support or click on the links that are in the show notes and in the chat for one time or monthly donation options. Your support, not just financially, but with your word of mouth makes a difference in keeping us able to share these messages of recovery. We look forward each meeting to receiving from the light reflected from our speakers. That light inspires hope, meaning, worth, and growth in us, the listening audience. Now I'm going to introduce our guest speaker for today, Michael S., and give a little background on him. Michael has been in a variety of 12-step fellowships over the last 11 years. His primary fellowship is AA. Even though he's not an alcoholic, he'll explain that a little bit here. Currently, he is most active in SLA, that's S-L-A-A, and CODA. Michael's favorite topic to speak on is emotional sobriety, but in this meeting, he'll talk about his experience sober dating and what living recovery is like today after 11 years in the rooms. He has been practicing as a licensed psychotherapist and life coach for the last 20 years, and he and his family live in the southwestern suburbs of suburbs of Chicago. Take it away, Michael. The floor is yours. Sorry, Michael. There we go. There you go. You're trying to mute me. Can you hear me okay? Yep, I hear you now. You're on. Go ahead. All right. Well, I'm going to do something a little different than I normally do, but I'm I'm going to pull up the chat. And if those of you, there's many people here I know, if you could put your uh, screen on so I could talk to you, it's helpful for me to talk to one person at a time. So you don't have to if you don't want to, but uh, that'd be helpful. Uh, before I start, I, I've always thought about, you know, wanting to be a, a public speaker. And the thing I would do as a public speaker is before we get started, my, uh, this is a vision I have, I'll do it here, is what do you want to hear today? Like, what do you want me to talk about? What would make a difference for you? What do you want to know about me that you might not know about me? There's some people here that I've known for a long time, but there's a lot you don't know about me. So I'm going to be quiet for a moment here. If you could throw something in the chat of a topic or a question, I'm going to start there because I get excited to do this because I'm self-centered and I'm egotistical and I'm righteous. And this is all about Michael. It's like the Michael show. But really, I do this to make a difference for people. And if I don't make a difference for people, this is useless. As a psychotherapist and a sponsor, so often I'll be done with a session and I'll say to the client, either at the end of that session or the beginning of the next session, wow, that was a great session we had last week. I mean, it just made, I just thought it was great. You made a lot of progress. And they're like, well, that was a shitty session. Not a good session at all for me. And I'm like, okay, well, so I know that if it feels good for me, it's often not good. And when it feels bad for me and I'm embarrassed off at a time or I'm stuttering or, you know, I get off, I'm like, oh, that, Justin, why did you have me on this show? Usually that's when I get the best feedback. So I'm going to be quiet for, I'll go 30 seconds here and see if anybody puts something in the chat. 
doesn't mean I'm going to talk about it. I might not like the topic. I might not want to share that here, but we'll see what happens. I wrote an article several years ago. Somebody interviewed me. It was remember this now. And and even in that 30 seconds, like listen to what goes on in your mind. Like, what's this guy doing? Why is this quiet? Like, what if nobody puts anything to chat? I'm not gonna write my question. That's a stupid question. Like, to me, that's what I gotta face every single day. I'm sure you guys do too. Maybe I don't know. All right. Well, we got so many questions. Oh, there are four new ones. Hold on. I'm seeing something. How have you arrived at the positive point in your life? Well, that's assuming it's positive, right? How, what, what has changed in your understanding of yourself, who you really are over the past 11 years, relationship with parents? Oh, man, good topics, guys. All right, I'm going to try to hit on some of these. Luckily, I prepared a little. I try not to prepare too much for this. Now, the only thing I have to really share with you is my own experience, strength, and hope, where I used to be what happened and where I am now. And uh, that's what I got. And I've worked the 12 steps and I've done a whole other thing in my life, but I think that's what makes uh, the rooms of 12 step this, this meeting so powerful is when I'm listening and somebody starts speaking about their parents or their relationship with their parents or their depression or addictions and they share. And all of a sudden I sit up and get to the end of my seat because, Oh my God, that is me. I've never met somebody like that. I never met somebody who shares that vulnerably or authentically. And that's what makes these programs so effective. Now, I've been a psychotherapist. I've done a lot of other personal growth and transformation over the years. But what sets the 12 steps apart is a community of people who have similar experiences and they're willing to share them. To me, uh, the definition of uh, humility now, some people don't like this, but a lot of people aren't going to like what I'm going to say. But I'm a codependent, somebody who is in CODA, and I learned from a very young age that I am responsible for how other people feel. That's my responsibility. And if somebody's angry or sad or guilty or shame or fearful from the way I'm being, well, that's not good, Michael. You got to look at that. And now that took years, decades millions of dollars. Maybe I looked at how much money I've probably spent in personal growth over the years to break that lie. I'm not responsible for how you feel. I mean, I'm looking at the screen and some people are smiling and laughing. Other people look like they're angry at me. Other people don't have their face up. Like, I, I'm sorry. I don't, I'm going to, I want this to make a difference for you. I'm trying my hardest, but some people aren't going to like me and that's okay. And I realize I'm not responsible for that. I'm going to go on tangents here because uh, just how I speak. I picked up this coin this morning. Uh, I have a whole bunch of these different recovery coins, coins, and I put a little piece of paper on it. I have different ones. One says faith. One says humility. One says generosity. And this one uh, is faith. I'm going to talk a little about faith today um, and then go into what my life is like now compared to where it was 11 years ago. Faith for me stands for find another individual to help find another individual to help And the best way i know how to regain faith when i don't have faith and i don't believe in something bigger than me is i pick up the phone and call somebody i call my friend bill call my friend greg call somebody in a program and say how are you doing how's your life what's going on with your recovery how's work how's your family now, that's really, really easy to do when I'm doing great and I feel great. But it really counts when I feel like crap, I feel depressed, I feel anxious, I don't want to get out of bed, I don't want to do anything, um, I have a lot of resentments towards people, places, and things. That's where it really counts. And then I start listening to that person. And I think God works through people. And then I start gaining some hope. Hope is hold on, pain ends. I think there's a difference between hope and faith. And to me, when I first started this program 11 years ago, um, I was what we call in the program white knuckling it. I'm going to try not to get emotional. I haven't got emotional in a long time. And I miss that. Um, 
for me, when I first step in these rooms, my thought was, if this doesn't work, I'm fucked. That was my thought. I, I, I don't know what else to do. I've done everything. And uh, 11 years ago, uh, I was starting to go through a divorce. I've been divorced nine years ago. And uh, that, for me, for those of you who went through a divorce, uh, I couldn't imagine anything worse. I, I mean, that, you know, I had a nine and six year old at the time. And how am I supposed to do this? Like this impossible. And when I'm thinking about faith today, I wrote some things down and, and uh, I just shouldn't be here. I really shouldn't. Uh, it's just a miracle. Um, if somebody had told me 11 years ago, this is where I'd be now, I just wouldn't believe them. It's impossible. Because what I'm aware of is that there's so many people who have went through something similar to me, and there's only few of us who survive. A lot of us don't make it. And you might say, well, that's because you worked harder, Michael, or that's because you wanted it more, or you had more money or this. No, that's not true. There's plenty of people out there who have worked just as hard, if not harder than me, and they didn't make it. Or they, so they didn't make it meaning they're dead. Or they didn't make it meaning they're still addicts. Or they didn't make it and they're still struggling big time with life. And that to me is, um, what's the word? Uh, I don't even know the word it, it is, is. It doesn't make sense to me. There's no logical reason for that. And I don't like that. I'm one of the, the addicts who's a, into, of the intellectual variety. I, I don't understand God. I don't understand faith. I can't get my arms around it. Even though I've been around this for 11 years, um, you know, my daughter, my 18, almost 18 year old daughter says, dad, I want to believe in God, but I don't. And I try to share with her why I do, but I can't for sure uh, believe there is a God. I have no clue if there's a God or not. Right. I don't have, I can't, but I choose to believe in God or a higher power because it makes life way more interesting. And so, because I don't know, I just make a choice. Wrote down here, um, how did I survive? For the first year and a half, there's some men here on the call that were there for me and they know uh, it was the most painful experience in my life. And when I, it, when I went, it was a loss. When you go through a loss, you grieve. And I never experienced this type of grieving, the type of grieving where you think you're doing okay, you're going along in your day, and all of a sudden you just get blindsided by these overwhelming emotions. And it actually would knock me down to the ground in the fetal position. And then I would breathe and get up and somehow move through my day. And then it would happen again. And uh, it was brutal. Um, I didn't believe in really God or spirituality at that point in my life. Uh, I'm a Jew and I went to synagogue and to me, synagogue is often more uh, like any religion, more rote and formulas and, and traditions, but I didn't get a lot of spirituality from it. And if people ask me, do I believe in God? I would say, yeah. If you ask my parents, would they believe in God? They would say, yeah. If you ask most people, most people would say, yeah, I do believe in a higher power, but I didn't connect or need to connect with that God on a day-to-day -day basis. I never really prayed, never really got down on my hands and knees. I didn't believe in that. But I did believe that in the program, they talk about no human power could relieve me of this, what we call it addiction, but it, for me, this, this pain, this feeling of hopelessness. And they said only a power greater than me could do that. Now, Unless you're desperate like I was, uh, to me, that'd be nonsense. I've been in thousands of meetings, met hundreds of thousands of people in these rooms over the last 11 years. I've yet to meet one person who came to this program and said, I'm just checking it out. I'm kind of struggling a little with something. And uh, I'm here to see if this is something I want to do. I've never met. I mean, maybe you guys have, but I never met a person like that. The people I meet are like me. They're so desperate. They've lost a lot. You know, for a rock bottom is different for each person. Um, and they're desperate. And they have to be here because this is their last chance. And so 
in these rooms, uh, I met people like me and I found a sponsor and I went to AA, but I'm not an alcoholic. I'll talk about that maybe a little later. Maybe you could, Justin, you could find what uh, episode I talked about that a lot. And I think it was the first time I was on. Um, so I'm not going to talk about that. But I learned that I'm not that different. As a, a guy, Paul, in one of my first meetings said to me, is Michael, I was kind of egotistical. I was, I don't know what, I was just angry. I was an angry man at life, angry at my ex-wife, angry, just angry. And he, he goes, Michael, you're not so you're unique. You're about as unique as an armpit. We both have two. Man, I didn't like that. And I learned a lot from these men. You know, I'm pretty educated. I got an undergraduate degree from Indiana University, a master's degree from University of Chicago. I'm a business owner. I st study a lot, read, well read. And But these people in the rooms, they had like eighth grade education. They had like two teeth. They had like chain smokers. They like drove a school bus. Nothing wrong with that. They were janitors. Those people inspired me. Those are my mentors, the people in the room. I got a friend of mine, I don't see him on this call today, but he says uh, he really doesn't have any friends outside the rooms of 12 Steps or people who've done a lot of therapy or a lot of personal growth. He just doesn't have a lot of people like that in his life. And I realized I don't either. I mean, I got a lot of people. I got family and I got parents. and But the people who haven't participated in this type of work and what I call spiritual, and I'll give my definition of spirituality in a second, uh, I accept them for who they are. I really have learned acceptance is the answer to all my problems. Bill, who's on this call, gave me an acceptance plaque that I have up in my house. I've moved three times in 11 years, but it always came with me. And it's the answer to all my problems. I really, really do accept people for who they are. I've learned to. And I've learned to accept them so much that I've decided not to spend time with a lot of them or spend limited time because they are who they are. And I don't play well with other people. I just don't. And it's taken me a long time to be okay with that. I turned 50 at the end of January this year. And something happened for me at 50 that I've got a lot firmer boundaries. Um, there's certain people that are toxic to me. There's nothing really wrong with them, but there's something about them that it just triggers me and, and has me go into a place where I don't like myself. And it's not because I haven't done a lot of work on myself. I mean, you find somebody who's done more work on themselves uh, in the last uh, 25 years than I do. I want to meet that person. I started doing personal growth work when I was 25 or 26. So for 25 years, I've spent millions of dollars, really millions. I've, I've added it up. Um, seen endless amount of therapists, read hundreds of books, been in thousands of meetings, sponsored many people, worked the steps five or six times. Uh, and I'm lucky to be here. Like, how's that? Um, let me talk a lot about spirituality. I'm reading this book called The Imperfection of Spirituality. I've read it before. I'm rereading it. And um, I like the definition. I might not get it exactly correct here, but what I remember from the, the book when I was reading it is people who are spiritual realize that they're broken, that they realize that they make a lot of mistakes. They realize that they have humility. They share things that they want nobody to know about. They share secrets. They share their character defects. They share their sins. Again, Bill's on the call here. I shared with him something yesterday that I've never shared with anybody. I can't share it here. It's just, I still... Uh, for me, when I make my shame public, that's when I'm able to thrive in life. And I'm an acronym person. I'll share some of shame is uh, should have already mastered everything. And that's how I feel. I don't know why. Maybe I was raised that way. But when I make a mistake, it's just I beat the crap out of myself. Another uh, acronym for shame is uh, self-hate and mental exhaustion. And I hate making mistakes. I'm trying to be perfect. I don't know about you guys, but that's my goal to be perfect. In this book, they said, well, if you're human, you're imperfect. You'll never, you're not God. God's perfect. You're not God. I don't like that. I like playing God sometimes. <laughs> right? 
doesn't work too well. I like controlling people, places, and things. Here's a piece. If I was at a party, I was talking to a client right before this, talk about 4th of July. I hate parties. Hate 4th of July parties. Hate graduation parties. I really pretty much hate people. I really do. Bill, again, I'm talking to you about a million times here because Bill's my best friend here. And he recommended me to his therapist. Not too thrilled about this guy because I drove like an hour and a half to see him. He charged $275 out of pocket. And the moment I get there, he told me he's moving to Israel in, in like a week. I'm like, oh, that's great. And then he told me the first thing he said, I really hate people, Michael. I don't like people. I'm like, you're a psychotherapist, dude. You've been doing this for 25 years. He goes, I don't like people. I like my clients and I like a handful of people. I don't have patience for people. Now, that's really hard to do in a world where you have to be around people. And you got to go to social events and you got to, you know, got to do that thing. I, I'm just terrible at that. You know, if I'm at a party, I'll just go up to you, Justin, and say, hi, Justin, my name is Michael. What's your mission statement? Uh, what's your biggest fear? Got any secrets that you've never told anybody? Uh, what do you think of our Donald Trump? Oh, you like him? Nice meeting you. I mean, I, I'm just kind of an asshole, I think. I don't know. I just, that's just who I am. And so as a psychotherapist for 20 years, we don't mess around. Like you get on the call with me or you see me and it's like, all right, let's jump in. We only have 50 minutes. Let's. And so I'm not good at small talk. I mean, I could do it with the best of you. I really can't. I've learned what's the book about quiet, like being a yeah, quiet by Susan Cain. Um, you know, being a, in an, an introvert in an extroverted world. Some people think, Michael, you're not an introvert. Yes, I am. Now, not so much an introvert in these rooms with you guys. I could talk about these topics forever. Oh my God, somebody put like a huge message in that. I'm not even going to read it, but it looked good. Oh, that was you, Justin. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, I'm introverted. I like you guys. I like my clients. I like people who tell the truth, who are, are who have humility. And humility, again, is, a, is the ability to be able to humiliate yourself. Like, I, I just don't. Maybe it's when I turn 50. I know there's some people here who are younger and older than me. I just need the truth. I don't, I don't have time. I'm going on this Alaskan cruise with my family in a couple of weeks. Uh, looking for the 12-step meeting. And people be like, you're going on a cruise and you're looking for a 12-step meeting. I'm like, yeah, that's where my people are going to be. And uh, I'm going to go to one every day, if not more. And I'm going to have a tough time. Vacations are hard for me. It's a vacation is not a vacation. I went to Northern Michigan with my girlfriend a couple last weekend and I had a great time, but it's hard. I got to prepare for vacations because I don't play well with people. Right. And I was excited to get back home because my life is a vacation. As an addict, I need structure. I need it so bad. I got to do my morning meditations. And I, have, I go to this thing called two-way prayer every morning. I go to a meeting almost every day now. And after 11 years, I thought maybe you guys knew something different than I did. After 11 years of working my ass off in this program, I thought you could put it on cruise control a, a little. No. I think the last couple of weeks, I've been going to more meetings, started to sponsor a new guy. I think I'm working this program harder than I did maybe when I first started. That's not good news. Somebody who told me that 11 years ago, I would have just, oh, I don't know. Uh, I couldn't even imagine that. And for me to thrive, I got to work just as hard, if not harder than I did 11 years ago. Now, a lot has happened in 11 years. Uh, four years ago now, this time from June 22nd to August 4th, I went to the Meadows, I went to rehab for love addiction, love avoidance, and uh, depression. Now, love addiction and love avo avoidance, never, ever heard of the term until four years ago. Take a look at it. There's a lot of stuff. I was like, wow, that's me. Yeah, that's definitely me. I didn't know that. And uh, never thought I'd go to rehab. One of my favorite things, I've shared this before a lot of times is uh, I was sitting in a group therapy session and there's four or five other people. And I'm thinking, I don't need to be here. I know what I'm doing. Like these people are really messed up. I, I, I could trust myself. And the thought that came through my mind was, Michael, 
I said, if people just do things like you know how to do things, if people just be more like you, speak more like you, talk more like you, just live life more like you, you could end up at the Meadows for 45 days in a rehab too. And that was humbling. Now, I love rehab. I'm jealous of people who relapse. Now, that sounds really messed up. I really am because they get to go back. If I had 50, 60, 80, 100, whatever they call, I would go back tomorrow morning. Rehab to me was like a vacation. It was like a kid in a candy store. It had everything I wanted. It had structure, it had free time. Somebody cooked great meals for me. I got to eat healthy. I got all the things I love to do. Therapy, group th therapy, acupuncture, meditation, 12-step meetings every night. It was heaven for me. And the goal then when I came back was try to create that atmosphere in my life on a day-to-day -day basis. And the reason people relapse so frequently, I was like one of the few people who this was the first time in rehab. There was people eight, nine, 10. One lady said she was in detox 19 times and she was like young, in her thirties maybe. And why does it happen? Is because I can't create that structure, nowhere near that structure on a day-to-day -day basis in my life. And I do pretty good. I tried to do as much as I do in rehab as I do on a day-to-day -day basis. And my life is way better. But this addiction is cunning, baffling, and powerful. They talk about that in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. And here's what I have to remember. And, and I just think every time a friend tells me this, a therapist tells me this, my therapist tells me this, it makes me have a, takes a, a deep breath and allows me to not be so hard on myself, is that, Michael, you have a disease in your brain. You have a brain disease of depression. You're a sex and love addict. You're a codependent. And it's a disease. There's something going on. There's a chemical imbalance in your brain. We haven't figured out how to fix it. We figured out there's a way to keep it in remission, right? Remission is go to therapy, do 12 steps, what I call the spokes of the wheel. I do, you know, there's a lot of spokes on a wheel and I do a lot of things, including 12 steps to keep me in remission. But even doing all that, this disease is so cunning, baffling and powerful out of nowhere. I have a guy that I'm started sponsoring and he said, I was sober for 87 days. And then one day out of nowhere, I relapsed. I call it a slip. I don't think it's a relapse. I call it a slip. And a slip stands for a sudden loss in priorities. And I get that. And it's so demoralizing. In the book, they call, talk about incomprehensible demoralization. Worst feeling in the world, doing well, and then you slip. Doing well, and then I slip. And after a while, it's like, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. I had enough. And uh, I have to have gratitude every day that I'm still here because... Uh, no matter how much I do, I slip a lot. And I think people who are not slipping, I don't admire those pers people that much. I used to. But if you're getting out of your house and if you're trying to live the best life you can and you're taking risks and going for what you really want to do in life, you're going to slip. I'll tell you how not to slip and be, you know, completely, in, I don't want to say integrity, but completely sober. Just don't leave your room ever. Don't do anything. Make no commitments and you'll be in great integrity. And you'll never slip. But you also, that equals what? No life. It's horrible, right? What else should I share? How much time do we have, Justin? What do you want? We've got about to two minutes before we jump into the Q&A portion. Okay, awesome. Perfect. All right. Well, what happened in those, these last 11 years? So four years ago, the Meadows joined a 12-step fellowship. I created a podcast 60 years ago, uh, out of the blue. 352 episodes, all about Michael all the time. Eight minutes to tell me each time, no guests. You know, once my kids get out and they sing and stuff, but it's all about me. Oh, here's what I would do at a party, too. <laughs> this will end this. Here's what I would do at a party. Um, I would go up to people and say, how selfish are you? Uh, are you egotistical? Do you have rage and anger problems? Um, when was the last time you cried? Um, how self-centered are you? 
And if they said, I, I have no rage, I'm not self-centered, and fuck you for even asking me any of these things. You want to fight? Like, ah, good, nice knowing you. I'll just walk away. Now, if people told me that and Bill that, right? I, I love that person. Nice to meet you. <laughs> I'm the most selfish son of a bitch you'll ever meet. I'm self-centered. I'm egotistical. I'm righteous. I'm working at a dude 25 years, right? Thanks for telling me. Let's talk about that. Now, here's the other thing I, I didn't realize. I'm also probably the most generous person I know. I'm kind. I'm patient. I'm loving. I've made a difference for a lot of people. Give a lot of money to charity. How can you be both? Well, you can. It's called your gold and your shadow. And I want people who share their shadow, accept it, are working on it, and are proud of it. So if you don't know what your shadow is, the thing you hide and suppress, really not interested in playing with you. So go find it. Okay. And then are you interested in talking about it and sharing it? And come over. We could have some play dates. Remember when you were a kid, you had like play dates with, at least we had play dates. All right. Do we don't leave with a question or anything, Justin? We just stop speaking and then we're done, right? Yeah. And then, then I'll ask you a few questions that I put <laughs> down. We've got some questions from our live audience here that have come in. And then we'll, uh, we'll keep this for another, what, 25 minutes or so if you're good with oh, that. Wow. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. All right. So um, thank you. Thank you so much, Michael. I've got, like I said, I've got several questions here. We've got a few that have come in from the live audience. And if any of you out in the live audience have a question for Michael, please type it in the chat. If you want to remain anonymous, you know, put, keep me anonymous or uh, direct message me that, uh, that question and we'll keep you anonymous. If you're okay with your first name being mentioned, we'll just Take it as you sent it. So let's let's jump to a first question here from Bill. Bill says, um, "What are your fears about small talk?" I mean, you 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 shared some of the questions that you would walk up to somebody in, at a party and just kind of dump these questions on them that would shock the the average person. So I mean, that's that that shows some courage, I guess. But what are some of your fears about small talk? The first thing that comes up for me, Bill, is just boring. I don't know if it's a fear. It's just Boring. I don't want to talk about politics. I don't want to talk about sports. I could talk about that, but uh, I don't trust that person. I think that's one of my fears, Bill, is I don't, I might, I like this quote. I don't know where I got it from, is I might like you, but I won't trust you until you really show me who you are. And I find that when I'm in small talk, I never heard of the word I. It's always you or them or those people. Well, how you doing, Bill? We we'll use Bill. You get your name talked a lot about here, Bill. How you doing? Well, my kids are doing great. You know, my mom's doing great. Okay, how you doing? Well, you know, th this election thing and, okay, how you doing? I, I never hear the word I. Um, yeah. Uh, no, that, that's my best I, answer, Bill. <laughs> yeah, and I think I think that uh, concept of you know small talk can so often be focused on external things. If they would just do this, you know, the if it, it, being a victim almost. And so I, I I really appreciate that. Thanks for opening my eyes to that concept of small talk being difficult or, or maybe empty. All right, got another question here coming from an anonymous member. How are the recovery program and therapy distinct? Would it, this person would love to know more, know more about when to seek either or both? Yeah, As I'm sponsoring somebody right now. We're working through the first step. Um, we're talking about it an easy, softer way. And if you could find an easier, softer way and a, and a quicker, more effective way to then do the 12 steps, don't come to 12 steps. 12 step is really hard. It's a lifelong process. It has you look and do things that, I mean... And so if you haven't tried therapy, try therapy before you come to 12 steps. Um, I'm a therapist, right? I love therapy. It's great, right? Now, the main difference between therapy and 12 step that I found is the first and second step. So the first step is that I'm powerless over my depression, powerless over my addiction, powerless over the, whatever that behavior you have. And my life is unmanageable. We don't talk about that in therapy. I'm not powerless. I could 
figure out why I am the way I am, heal those wounds. Powerless is not a good word. Powerless to me, uh, the way I like to say powerless is uh, if you come over to my house and say, I'm going to move your refrigerator, your bed, and your couch all by myself in one trip. No, I don't care who you are. You're not power. You don't have the power for that. Right. So that is one of the big. Now, the second thing, I'll say three things. The second thing is the second step came to believe that a power greater than me or you can bring me to sanity. What the hell is that? Power, like I, I'm, I never heard that in my life. What the hell is that power greater than me? And that's going to bring me to sanity. And so the 12 steps talks about powerlessness and a, a, a belief in spirituality and God and that God could help you recover from your addiction. That is right. And then it says, bring you to sanity, which means that I have to be insane. What? I don't understand that. And then the third thing is a group, this fellowship of people there who are no different than me. I think group therapy or group, whatever, so much more effective than individual therapy because I get to see myself in all these people here and they, I don't have to reinvent the wheel. I just go find somebody who has something I want and just tell me how to do it. There's a formula in this 12 step. I don't think we have that in therapy so much. They talk about therapy as there's a lot of different modalities and they say at the end of the day, none of them is more effective than the other. What really makes it is the relationship you have with your therapist. But in 12 steps, we have a, it's very formatted in the, in the workbook I use uh, by Cameron C, who is a cocaine anonymous. It's 32 pages and it's a formula. And if you do the formula, you could recover. But guess what? I've attempted to sponsor, just I don't know about you, 50, 60, 70 men over the last 11 years. I think I've got maybe four or five men through the 12 steps. I lose them, especially at step four. I ask them, what are your character defects? What are the things that you got to work at? Where are you selfish, self-centered, egotistical, righteous, lustful? Well, what do you mean, Michael? Well, that's not me. All right, well, go find another sponsor. All right, well, some people are going to see it. Okay, then there's this other column column five, which is you have these resentments towards other people and you've been self-centered, egotistical and righteous. And so there's this column five, which is, well, how are you at fault? Do you have any responsibility in this? I don't know about you guys, but man, of course not, guy. This is what guys say. Of course not, Michael. Don't you understand my, you know, my mom's this, my wife's this, my kid's this. You're saying I'm responsible? I, I, I play some role in this? You got to be crazy. You're off your rocker. All right. I don't know if that answers your question, but therapy is great, obviously. And for me, I got to do therapy and 12 steps and read books and meditate and do all these things uh, simultaneously because uh, that's how sick I am. And there's another thing I would ask people at a party, how sick are you? <laughs> That'd be our first question. And if they said, I'm not sick at all, I'm mentally stable. I'd be like, oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> I'm running to the other side of the room, dude. You're the sickest person in this room. Because I know that about me. Right? All right. Yeah. That didn't really get sort of answer no. the question. No, that's good. That's good. Thank you for sharing those things. Got another anonymous question in here. This person says, thank you for your rigorous honesty, Michael. People trigger me as well. What is the first action you make after you are triggered by others? Run. <laughs> Run. <laughs> <laughs> no. Oh, that's such a good question. Well, I've learned that there's certain people that trigger me. They like breathe the wrong way or there's just certain family members or just certain people that um, I can't be around or only can be around for limited time. And it's not about me doing more work. It's just, I don't know what it is. Um, but when I am triggered in the moment, it's really hard to do. But then I get on the phone with Bill <laughs> and then I call my therapist and then I go to a meeting and then I talk to my sponsor. Then I pray and meditate. Then I go to two way prayer meeting and then I try to help another person. And then I got to do all these things. But when I get triggered, it's always about me. Right. You heard this analogy you spot it. You got it. I've lost a lot of clients in around this over the years. I'd probably be very wealthy without this statement. But I think it's the most powerful one, which is. Uh, if there's something that triggers me, it's always about me. I just don't want to look about it, look at it. And so if I spot, I only can see in others what is true in me. So that's about both the good and the bad. So if I, if you're generous and kind and loving and 
The only reason I can see that in you is because I must have those qualities too. But that, that is a good question. I mean, I, we have a t- I have a tough addiction. I mean, I kind of wish I was an alcoholic or a cocaine addict or a gambling addict. I, I think those are, I don't want to say easier addictions, but like you can live without that. Like with a sex and love addict, like I'm addicted to like women who are pretty and give me attention and validation and find me interesting and want to talk to me. And, you know, there's certain people I'm a, you know, that triggers me. It's like, I often go to these sex and love addiction meetings with a whole bunch of women. It's like an alcoholic sitting at a bar with a favorite alcohol, just sitting in front of them, you know, for an hour and say, don't drink it. Now I've got better, but I've, I've got kicked out of sex and love addiction. I got kicked out of it. So I was inappropriate. I was so mad. You don't get kicked out of 12 step programs, but I direct messages, people. I don't know about you guys. I probably might be able to do and to go in these meetings, like scroll, see who's on, see who looks good. You know, maybe they'll text you. Bill and I joke around this. Like a, a woman might come up to me at the beginning of my recovery and say, Hey Bill, how you doing today? And from my mind, that's like, she wanted to sleep with me. It's like, why you want to get married? This girl really likes me. That's how sick I was, Justin. So what was the question again? <laughs> the question was, how do you deal with uh, when you feel triggered by people? And I think okay. uh, I think I sort of answered it. <laughs> yeah, I think you did too. Good stuff. Okay. All right. Another question from our live audience this is from Ellie. Ellie says, how do you get out of the shame spiral when you've lost your sobriety and are trying to get back on the path? And she added in, I'm in Love Addicts Anonymous and Coda for, context, uh, for context. So what are your thoughts yeah. and experience on that? Let me read that question. How do you get out of the shame spiral when you've lost your sobriety and you're trying to get back on path. To me, that's where the higher power comes in. And I didn't have this before the program is I got to pray and I got to meditate and God help me. I just did this thing. I said I wouldn't do for the 19th time in four weeks. Help me. Who am I talking to? I don't know who I'm talking to. And then I got to talk to, I got to reach out to somebody and talk to them, make my shame public and realize I have a disease. This is the one that really gets me. Every, my therapist says this to me. This really touches me in the soul when I say this in my heart. She goes, Michael, you have a disease. You're not a bad person. You're one of the most motivated people I know. You're one of the most knowledgeable people I know. You've, when you make things happen, you know, but you have a disease and you wouldn't beat yourself up so much if you're like, oh my cancer came back or I broke my arm again or whatever. You just wouldn't, you just be like, yeah, I got a disease. So that helps me a lot. Um, for me, it's not so much if I'm going to fall off the wagon or I'm gonna, I'm going to break my sabar. I'm going to slip. And there's a big difference for me, but it's for me, it's how quick can I get back on it? And for me, it doesn't take long now. Sometimes within a couple hours, sometimes a couple days, never, more than a week because I'm on meetings. I'm talking to people. I'm talking to my therapist. I've got, uh, there's a guy, his name is Kevin McCauley. He's a senior fellow at the Meadows and he has this thing called the the Swiss cheese model or something. It is a lot of pieces of cheese, of Swiss cheese. So one cheese slice fails. Well, you have another one. If that one fails, you have another one. So that's how I get back. Uh, but that shame spiral Yeah, that's the best answer I have. And it's hard, especially the longer I'm around and the more sobriety I have. Did you know this? Somebody told me this. Maybe I'm wrong. That people in recovery who have worked the 12 steps are actually 80 times higher likely to commit suicide than people who are not in the program. And that made no sense to me, but it does make sense to me now because now I'm in the program and I know what to do. I know how to do it. And I continually make mistakes. And then I have to go back to square one. And I do it over and over. At a certain point, it's like, I just got to take myself out. This is exhausting and embarrassing. And so, yeah, that shame spiral. I think that's what kills most addicts. It's shame. Yeah, it's not over drinking. It's, it's the shame of I fucked up again and I hate myself. I'm worthless. Been there. Right. If you're in this program 11 years or in this program enough, uh, you've been in that shame spiral. And that's why uh, we're the 
the, one of the very few people who make it. Now look out, there's how many people are here? Like, I don't know, 20 people here? Something like that. Justin invited 900 people. I invited like 100. And we got 20 people here. And it's not because those people are so healthy, right? And some are busy, but we invited 1,000 people? That's crazy. Go ahead. Yeah, no, this is this is good. Now, I, I want to talk, dig a little bit on that, Michael. You said, hey, if I'm in that shame spiral, it's kind of a higher power thing, a step two thing. Um, yeah. And then the shame that comes from, from you know, oh, I, I drank again, I used again, I whatever I did again, I, I suck. And then you talk about how you practice two-way prayer. That's part yeah. of your morning routine. Tell me a little bit about how that communication, maybe with your higher power, can help you with that shame spiral thing and how maybe your higher power sees or interacts with you to get you out of that shame. Yeah. Well, let me talk about two-way prayer. That may be the best way to talk about it. So I do two-way prayer. I'll tell you about it in a second. Or maybe Justin, you'll put a link in or we'll throw a link in more. And I'm not going to talk about that much because you could figure it out. I do it two times a day, 7.30 in the morning to 8.30 in the morning central time and 8 o'clock to 9 o'clock p.m. central time for every single day for the last over a year. And that's how I get out. One of the reasons I get in my shame, because guess what? We, we all, the way it works is basically they play some music, you write for 10 minutes, see what God has to say to you. And then they break us into breakout rooms of two to three people. And then people share their writings and they share their shame. That gets me out of the shame spiral when I hear other people's story. And then often I feel not so bad of what I'm doing because I hear what they do. They're no different than me. I mean, it's a miracle I'm not in jail. A miracle I haven't lost my license. A miracle. You know, the, what's the word I want to say? It's the worst thing about addiction for me is I'll say, I'll never cross this line. I'll never do that. And then I do it. I'll never do that. And then I'll do it. And so when people share horrible war stories, oh, man, when I sh it's one of the reasons I don't talk to parties and talk to people a lot. Because when I share, if I shared my things I've done, the judgment of people, what were you thinking? How did you go in debt? Why would you say that? That's how I know somebody's not in recovery. And that's people I don't want to associate with. But in recovery, it's like, thanks for sharing. You think that's bad. Let me tell you what I did. I mean, yeah, it's a tough conversation when I think about going on my cruise. I'm not looking forward to that now because I got to not share who I really am because there's people who will judge the shit out of me. And I'm not good at that. I'm not strong enough to deal with that um, too much. So, mm. I, but two, I love, two way prayer. It's, it's yeah. to me, it's, I guess, the shame spiral. I guess what I want to say about that uh, is, when I hear other people share their experience, strength, and hope, it helps me get out of my shame. Thank you for sharing that. And, you know, you mentioned, you know, going on a cruise, and I love that most, well, all the cruises that I've been on, which is only a handful, all had friends of Bill W. meetings on board. Best meetings, best, best thing ever for a cruise ship. <laughs> Go get in those friends of Bill W. meetings. So, yeah. And then also, um, right after we get done with this, if you wouldn't mind sending me the link to the two way prayer meeting you attend, sure. I'll post that yeah. in the show notes of the podcast. Um, and I love that. And, and another uh, resource was just posted in the chat about how to listen to God, um, yes. by Wally P fantastic yeah. book. And I'll put link to that in the show notes of the podcast. Also, I have another question for you. Um, so, so Michael, you talked about Early on in your in your talk, you ta he, he said something like, "I choose to believe in God because that makes life more interesting." I'd like for you to expound on how life is more interesting with this choice to believe in God. Hmm. That's a darn good question. Well, life is just pretty mundane if I do what I normally do every day, and if I don't I think it's one of the big things after. 45 days at rehab and tens and tens of thousand dollars. I think at the end of the day, what I got out of it, the, the main thing I got out of it is I got to walk slower, be more aware 
of what's around me and realize that God has something to do with all that. And where did, how did that happen? So if you want to pay $50,000 and go to rehab, that's what you get. And to me, that was, that's terrible news. <laughs> uh, of course I got a lot more, but I need to find some meaning in life. Otherwise, Mon, you know, when I I can't, I gotta find a way to make the mundane extraordinary, or not even extraordinary, the mundane tolerable. Life to me is. Well, my mom said this to me, and I try not to talk about my mom and dad too much, and my family members too much because they've asked me not to. Some people, some family members, and I get that. But my mom said, "Why do you go all these meetings, Michael, and you just hear these people like?" And they're miserable and misery and war stories. And can't you just be happy? Well, fucking trying, mom. That's what I'm doing. And these people help me. Um, I can't even answer that question here. I'm just kind of babbling. I don't even know how to answer that question. <laughs> no worries. No worries. It, it, when when you said that, I'm like, I, I want to dig into this myself and think about that. So I was just wondering if you had already processed that a little bit more because, oh, no, that's good stuff. I have another question from our live audience. Sam says, how do you interact with family? I can't be my true self around them and it gets exhausting, but I can't just run from them, as you said. Uh, thoughts on that with, with family and you started ta touching on your mom, but uh, talk about other family like that. That's a brutal question. That's a hard one. Well, I find a lot of times I run. I really do because it's too toxic for me. Um, or I, I have to limit it to time. I talk to them. Or I have to focus on some commonalities. We have conversations that we have commonality in. It's often, you know, sports or movies or. But yeah, I know some of my family has listened to this. This is hard because I don't share my truth because I don't feel safe sharing my truth with them because I feel very judged often. And I'm the, you know, I'm the basket case in our family. I, just want, I don't know about you guys. Nobody in my family has ever seen a therapist, right? I, I just can't even, I mean, nobody in my family is deaf. There's one, uh, I have an aunt who's in recovery. We're really, really close. Nobody's been divorced. Uh, what? And Michael's fragile. Michael could be suicidal. Michael, he's over emotion. Michael's, he's a lot. And so... I'll say this in the risk of, uh, I'm really more cautious about what I say about my family. And I don't like that because it has me not speak my full truth because I want to hurt their feelings. And that's part of my codependency. Um, but I want to say this, I lost this train of thought. Shoot, it was so good. I lost it. Do you hate that guy? Is it the <laughs> best thought and you lose it? Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, maybe it'll come good. back here in a minute. It might come back. Yeah. Uh, we have a comment uh, from a listener here that's so happy to have found you today because this person is so much like you and always feels so alone. So anyways, if anybody and says how, you know, basically, how can I get in contact with you? If anybody wants to get in contact with Michael, you can send me an email at uh, rico12pod at gmail.com, R-E-C-O-1-2-P-O-D at gmail.com, and I can get you connected with Michael. And uh, that way we um, we make sure that's good. All right. Good. Um I do have one more question for you before we start wrapping up here, Michael. You, uh, this phrase, I loved this phrase, and I'd like you to expound on it just a little bit more. Humility is the ability to be able to humiliate myself. Talk to, okay. talk to us a little bit more about that phrase and how, why that is an important uh, aspect to have as well as to understand. Yeah. Well, I'm not, no, not creative on this one, which is if I don't find some humor in all this, I'm going to cry my eyes out. I'm going to... I'm just not going to be here. I'm just going to, I've got to bring some light and laughter and levity to this craziness of my life. Um, I think that's why I don't share with my family. Go back to that question is when I share this stuff, they don't connect with me like, Oh, and I'd like to have answered that question. That's I'm glad you connect with me. I that's, that's what I want to do. I want to speak and people, everybody come up to me at the end or at a meeting and said, I'm no different than you. 
versus family. I'm so different than you. I don't get in debt. I don't make those mistakes. I don't reach out to these people. I don't, I don't get that. I feel like the most abnormal person in the world. Um, humility. So yeah, um, it's my mission, my mission statement. I created this about 25 years ago is to create a world of honesty, authenticity, and integrity by speaking my truth and sharing my experience, strength, and hope. Um, that's the biggest impact I could have in the world, I think. And uh, when I can't do that with certain people because of a fear of fill in the blank, then I get depressed. And to me, depression, I struggle, I struggle with, I struggle with depression. It's just suppressing my anger and my sadness and my feelings. And uh, I lived like that for a lot of my life. So yeah, to answer your question about humility, it's just, uh, I like talking about myself and I want to be around people who like talking about themselves too. And most people do not like talking about, not like their job and their work and how much money they make. Like, tell me your fears. I wish I could sit with Donald Trump and I don't like Donald Trump. I'm going to be public about that. And I just don't like the dude. I've never did. And, and I like what Oprah said about him years ago, which is if you had some time with Donald Trump, what would you say to him? And she said, nothing. I don't talk to people who don't listen. Now, I would have a very short conversation with Donald Trump. It would be very short. Or really most people who maybe, I don't know what the word I'm looking for. You come to my office and I said, tell me some of your biggest fears. Tell me something you lied about and you want to tell me the truth about. Tell me something that you are scared of. Tell me about uh, your dad and how horrible he was to you and your brother. And tell me about the time when you got kicked out of kindergarten and what it was like to be a fat little kid. Tell me about your wounds. Tell me about your insecurities. This, I mean, it would laugh literally. It'd be like a 0.2 second therapy. It's like, and I, you wouldn't say anything or what do you do? And I said, well, I'm not going to listen to a lot. I don't know what it is. It would be so quick. And it'd be nice to meet you, Mr. Trump. And that'd be it. Right. So I don't know how to answer yeah. again your question. You ask okay. me questions and I kind of just keep talking. <laughs> no worries, man. Well, thank you, Michael. Uh, before we get uh, wrapped up here, do you have any final words of wisdom for us? Hmm. I'm thinking of serenity prayer, right? And the words of word, do I have anything to say or do I? Uh, I think I said everything and I just say to everybody is keep going out there and sharing your experience, strength and hope, especially men. We don't have enough men in this program, um, any programs from my perspective and the people who judge you and the people who you don't feel safe with, don't do it with them because it's too toxic for us. We're the type of people that I'm sensitive, right? And limit your, um, circle get it smaller and smaller and smaller and spend limited to no time with people who don't respect your boundaries who aren't good uh playmates and honestly who haven't done extensive work on themselves because those people um i don't think will help your recovery that's my words of wisdom. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much, Michael. I really appreciate your words as you've spoken today in this RICO 12 speaker meeting. If any of you out there have additional questions for Michael or would like to connect with him, you can join our WhatsApp community. You can uh, do that by sending an email to rico12pod at gmail.com. You can also request to be connected with Michael through that same email. If you haven't already done so, please consider rating and reviewing this podcast on Apple Podcasts. It is a powerful way to work our step 12. Um, by getting the message out to more people who may be searching for it. Next Friday, we will hear from Mike L., a first-time speaker on RICO 12. His topic will be spirituality in recovery, and I look forward to hearing his talk. Um, so now let's launch off into the rest of our day. What do you think? Should we do serenity prayer? What do you think, Michael? Yeah, that's a good one. You want to lead us in there? Just say that sure. for us. Thanks. I'll do the serenity prayer. Let's do the we version. So oh God, grant us the serenity to accept the things we cannot change the courage to change the things we can and the wisdom to know the difference. Thy will, not ours, be done. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Michael. Everybody, remember there is one that has all power. That one is your higher power. May you find God now 
keep coming back. Continue to work this road, this this work. Trudge this happy road. Of de- Ooh, I'm really I'm really struggling right now. Let's trudge this road of happy destiny together. Work it. You are worth it. There was a man put his hand by the side of his mouth, and he wanted to scream, but the sound never came out. Thank you. 